So I, I just want to say this isn't like a super technical talk. This is, um, I want to talk about like what I know best, which is machine learning tools and startups. <laughs> um, so this is going to be about things I know, which is like me and the startups that I started and kind of the state of um, machine learning. Um, so I, I hope that's interesting to you all. Um, uh, I have to say, I, um, I'm so happy to meet a whole bunch of people that are customers of my tool. It just like it makes me love South Park Commons like so much. Um, and I also say, for those of you that are using us, we would love to have you come by our office and talk about um, what you're doing. That would, that would be super cool. And it's not fair, but you get better technical support if you come meet the engineers in person. Yeah, we've been very motivated. When you, like when there's an angry user that you can like, you know, you, you've like met them, you feel so much more afraid of their wrath. <laughs> Um, so I'm just curious, how many people like work on machine learning day to day? Have y'all? It's about half. And how many people are like doing a startup? Is that like everyone? Interesting. Okay, about half too. Cool. Um, yeah. So I thought I thought what I mean I was really trying to think about like what would be relevant to y'all, and I was thinking um, just sort of like telling you about um, my startup journey. I thought it would be helpful because I've now like been doing it like a fair amount of time. I was actually looking back to um, people were talking about TechCrunch, and I was looking at this. I was 2009, I launched Crowdflower at TechCrunch 50. Um, I remember being like so afraid, and um, and and I remember I wanted to kind of talk to you about like my thought process of starting it, and then like what actually happened because I was working in machine learning, and um, I was um, I was really inspired by this paper. I don't know if you guys remember this. It was um, well, the guy I knew was Peter Norvig, who was like research director at at Google, and um, I think this paper is funny. I, I keep rereading it. And I'm just like, this is such a smart paper where he, he's basically saying, you know, this thing that like everyone kind of noticed, which was that the algorithms, the, the places where machine learning was successful were places where um, there was a lot of training data. Just kind of like just, and it wasn't like, you know, situations where, you know, sort of the algorithm was like easy or hard or the problem was easy or hard. It just was completely like where there was sort of like a data exhaust um, that, that you could use was just, that was every case where Google found um, machine learning worked, and then I'll show you the slides that I used to um, to pitch VCs back in 2009 that like totally didn't work, right? But um, <laughs> and like sign of the times, I think it's fun. It's like naive Bayes and like Maximetry and SVM, you know, are the, <laughs> the three algorithms that I, um, you know, I tried, and and so um, I still think this is just kind of amazing today. So this is like from I can't even remember what paper this is from, but it's like it's basically like saying. Like, you know, here's like how much training that I had, and here's like, you know, the bad random baseline, and here's my like fancy green line that does some like smarter approach. And um, and so you can see here, like, you know, naive Bayes is like, you know, 19% error rate, and SVM is like, you know, 16% error rate on some classification task that I did 10, 12 years ago. Um, <laughs> and um and you know, I pointed out like, okay, like actually what I did back when I was working. Um, in 2006, you know, 2007, 2008 at search companies, um, you know, we would do a lot of feature, um, feature selection and we would think a lot about like what are the right features. And on this case, you know, like unigrams, like bigrams works a little better. For some reason the combination works even better in this, in this case. Um, and that does get um, an improvement, but then, you know, um, basically like every time you double your um, data size, you get maybe a bigger improvement, at least on this data set. And, um, and this was not, common knowledge back then. Like, like people were kind of surprised to learn this. And it's kind of funny because actually this, this paper um, is actually like, I mean, it's, it's, it's like this paper is actually kind of ignoring the fact that like the x-axis here is the amount of data. So you can actually just get the fancier algorithm by like doubling your data set size. Right? Like it's, and it's so funny because it's like, you know, it's, it's like if you were actually trying to like accomplish this goal, You'd almost certainly rather double your training data set size than um, than do the fancier algorithm, but like no one, no one's really paying attention to that. Um, and then there's like still this effect that I never like found a paper that did this, but basically like cleaner data, like in cases where your data is not clean, it's like it's such a powerful effect. I feel like everyone kind of knows it, and it's one of these things that like I think it's like it's just not the right incentives to publish a paper on it. So there's not a lot of like literature on it, but I feel like everyone working in ML, um, you know, kind of knows this and feels this, that like if you pull out 
um, the mislabeled cases, or the, the just even like the case with the high residuals, um, that can really improve your um, algorithm. So that's what that's what I noticed, and I thought. I mean, I was like an ML researcher back then, and I was like kind of looking at this, and I thought, oh, like there's like an obviously like a useful company here that like labels training data. And if I just like make it, then like certainly will be successful. Um, and that was definitely not the case. It, it like you know it was like years of like um, you know not having sales, and like back then you like couldn't raise money um, without like having like a significant amount of revenue. Um, <laughs> Definitely not the case anymore. Yeah, how things yeah. have changed. How things have changed. <laughs> uh, what a beautiful time. Let's all enjoy it. <laughs> um, I should turn off this video camera. Um, <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of wanted to show just like where we ended up. So like you know, we um, we built this platform, and like you know, I think actually this is another interesting thing. Like when I I was conceiving of the company as a almost like a math problem, right? Because it's like you have these people that are like doing labeling. And you don't know like who you can trust and who you can't trust, and um, and then you're trying to like tease out like what are the correct labels um, by like kind of comparing people's results. And I had a very kind of like um, al algorithmic mindset to the problem, and it actually turned out that um, that wasn't a lot of the value of the company. It had like a small effect, but um, by far the bigger effect to getting high quality labels was this um, feature that we didn't. Um, we just did not appreciate how valuable it was at the time, which was actually just having good templates so that people could, for common labeling tasks, um, start with a good set of instructions and like a very good interface. It turned out to be like the key. Um, and still, I think you know, like if you were going to use Figure Eight, um, what I would tell you is that um, I think the best part of it is that we have really high quality um, templates, and especially in um, especially in uh, uh, like you know, doing like semantic segmentation, doing any of this image stuff, you really need to have good quality tools. Like for example, here it's do, like you know we're doing um, this super pixel thing where we like take big chunks, so you can actually like label the big chunks of pixels that we're pretty sure are the same thing. Um, and so like things like that become, you know, you can imagine like labeling every pixel individually or using putting it in Photoshop, which was kind of the state of the art in 2016. Um, this was like a hundred times faster. Um, and actually, that was when, the, so like for, for years and years, the company um, had a pretty hard time. It's actually kind of funny. We had competitors back in 2009, and literally all of them um, went bankrupt. And we were the only company like crazy enough to kind of keep going. <laughs> and then, um, and, and we just like waited and waited. And it wasn't until actually um, self driving car companies came along that the, the market started to take off. And I was, it's funny, I was, um, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll tell you some more stuff in a minute. But one thing that, um, I think one thing that, that was kind of interesting was like Google wrote this awesome blog post in 2017. This is actually 10 years after um, Norvig's paper where they go back and they look at like really big numbers of examples. And actually, I feel like this is already out of date because if you're doing ML, you're probably like, ah, like 100 million <laughs> data points, like it's small, you know? <laughs> but, um, but like what they found is that the, um, the quality kind of keeps improving steadily, right? As you keep going up orders of magnitude of data, it seems like this effect kind of happens forever. Um, where the algorithms just have this steady improvement based on the log of the size of the input data. Um, and then there's sort of this evocative um, analysis someone did of sort of like the breakthroughs in AI kind of happening after the relevant data sets um, became available, which I think ImageNet is one that we like feel a lot, right, where that seemed to cause a lot of um, like interest in, in CNNs and um, vision algorithms. And, and like, you know, they, they're kind of saying, this, this person sort of saying this happens across lots of different um, domains. So I really do think that training data is like an underrated um, driver of innovation. Um, and I think you see like, you know, I think like there would be, for example, I think there'd be a lot more innovation in um, health, healthcare, if there were um, data sets available. There just aren't. And so I think you actually see a lot less um, innovation than you might. There's like another effect that I think is like um, I see everywhere that I think people don't really appreciate, and if you haven't like worked in a bigger company on a big deployment, which is a sort of human the loop design pattern, um, which also became one of the things that Figure Eight was really known for. We did not actually intend to do this when we started the company, but it was like an unexpected use case that people really loved, which is like you know they actually have an AI classifier, like some else system, and they take confident output and they they use it, and then when it's not confident, they want a quick human annotation. 
Um, and so we were really good at like doing really fast um, annotations so that people could use it like right inside some kind of loop. It wasn't like instantaneous, but we could do it in like a couple minutes. Um, and so this became really, um, this was really powerful. It's a really good design pattern. And, and actually, um, you might know that, that these annotations, because they're the ones where the AI cluster is not confident, not only do you get like a business process that's just kind of working, but these are actually outsized value in terms of improving the algorithm. So if you look at like, I think if, at least like from what I saw, like if you look at lots of um, companies where they actually have deployed ML and they've had it deployed for a while, you almost always see some version of this happening, right? So it's like the, the real key, I think, to getting ML like working in a long-term way is like being able to handle this not confident case in some kind of natural way and also this retraining. Um, it's amazing how many companies actually have built infrastructure to independently build infrastructure to do this retraining live. Um, but there's kind of fun examples. I don't know, like, I just think this postal service is a really cool example that, like, really does this, right? And, like, they actually deployed an OCR system in 1982, and, but they only deployed it on, like, 20% of the, um, the envelopes because, you know, there's, like, 20% they could actually get confidently. And I guess even now they only they run it on, like, 99.5%, but there's 0.5% they get a human review still. So they've been actually running this human loop design pattern for a long time. And then there's actually another crazy example um, where Coca-Cola did this incredibly, um, it's a video camera, incredibly, um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> some, maybe, some might say over-designed um, thing where you can like, like you know, the, the, the horrible state of the world before ML, you had to like type these letters into a computer to know if you won like a prize. And um, ML came along and you could put a camera on it and it would show you the letters mostly transcribed. <laughs> and now, um, now you can save seconds to find out if you like, want a free soda. Um, but I think like, one, of the, one of the cool things that they did actually, they really, um, they really did a whole, they did a whole um, post, blog post, the detailed blog post about how they actually did this. And they actually do do a human loop system, right? Where they're like looking at the letters where they think it might be wrong calling those red so you can go in and then correct them, and then retraining um, their neural network to, um, to keep improving it. And I think like now we can show these um, case studies. Like this is a real world um, case study uh, and real world thing, right? We had like, you know, each week we had about 400,000 support tickets and we wanted to, um, the ML team wanted to basically know which of these support tickets um, involved uh, possible drunk driving. And, um, and so the, they'd feed them into the ML model. The ML model was actually really accurate, but it wasn't 100% accurate. And they just had zero tolerance um, for any false um, negative. And so they, they tuned it to only do 40, basically label like 40%. And they'd get the rest labeled. And then they would, just, they would feed that back um, into the algorithm. And you watch every week, it would get better and better. And I kind of thought um, they'd be disappointed by like a 40% um, uh, like only being able to use it 40% of the time, but they actually were like so happy, right? Like from their perspective, they're like, wow, this is like a 40% cost savings. You know, have like a huge um, budget for us. So um, I don't know, I guess that, that was, it was just sort of interesting the way that the ML team was like a little bit disappointed. The, the business people were like super, super happy um, with, the, with something like this, where it was just like, you know, it's like just really reliable, right, that 40% of the time. Um, and, um, and then um, it was acquired for 428 million Australian dollars. <laughs> um, and, um, and actually, it was kind of interesting. I don't know, a couple of things were kind of intrigued me about this. So Appen was an Australian company that we hadn't really like, paid attention to very carefully. Um, but they had quietly, uh, they were like a $5 billion market cap company with, with just a handful of customers. But they were like, you know, big tech companies right in our backyard. So they had actually gone um, at the very, very top of the market and, um, and sold into there. And so it was kind of, it was just interesting, like, you know, I think like we in Silicon Valley sometimes, I think, like, pay attention to the other, like, Silicon Valley companies around us. So it was kind of interesting to have a company with a very different model um, that was, like, very successful and ended up, ended up buying us. Um, so I don't know, that was, like, an interesting, um, an interesting 10 years. Um, and then um, I, 
spent some time in my basement. <laughs> and I built this robot. I am really not good at um, building robots, but I really love to build robots. <laughs> but I like decorated it. <laughs> um, and I, I guess this is an impressive moment. My stuff's so out of date. I don't know. A few years ago, I was really proud that I got, um, I got an image classification model running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and uh, so anyway, I was, I was pretty proud of myself. Um, and I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking, um, like, I was thinking about what to do next. Oh man, I can't see too much here. This is totally not doctored footage. <laughs> the way it like, like skips some time. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, but, um, so, I was thinking like, um, I was kind of reflecting on what I really, and I think this is not a bad way to start a company. Like people ask me sort of how do you like think about like starting a company and, and like the way I thought about it was like, well, you know, what did I like and not like about, um, about figure eight? And I thought like, you know, the, the, there's a lot of hard parts actually, but, but one part I really loved was spending time with um, ML practitioners. Like, and, and so I felt like, you know, I'm just going to like work backwards from, what ML practitioners want and just try to like make something that um, they're actually going to want. And that was actually, actually all I had, right? It wasn't like I had any idea of what it was. And I quickly kind of, you know, I talked to some people and I thought, okay, this is going to be developer tools for deep learning. That's going to be the company. And I felt like a lot of people were making these like ML platforms and, and I felt like, you know, the developers I know, none of them actually want a platform. Like the VCs I know really want to invest in an ML platform. <laughs> um, but it doesn't seem like people actually want to use an ML platform. So um, I was like, you know what, I'm going to make it. I'm gonna, it's going to be developer tools. And I remember actually, like, you know, my, my friends who were VCs were all like, call it developer platform, dude. You'll get like double the valuation. Like, uh, <laughs> um, and so I was kind of like excited about it. Um, and then uh, this guy Clemens wrote this awesome article, <laughs> um, which I thought was kind of interesting to just see an article. Um, well, the person was just like the opposite um, point of view for me. Because actually he's like, the points that he's like pointing out in his article are like the opposite conclusions I reached, right? Like he's like, don't provide developers, provide solutions. And um, like build a full end-to-end -end stack throughout the world. You know, it's like, it's like literally the core like principles that I was like coming up with um, were the opposite of him. And, um, and then he went and worked for it. Now he's a PM at a developer tools for a deep learning company, so. <laughs> <laughs> like not long after he wrote this article. So maybe he was trying to get people to not do it. But if you want to get dissuaded from a developer, well, I guess I'll send up the slides, but you can find this article. And he's pretty persuasive. He's like a very like, he's a very clear thinker. He makes a lot of good points. I don't even, I couldn't even, I tried to write a rebuttal and I was like, you know what, I just want to make developer tools. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess. <laughs> And so here's, here's what I was, what I was pitching was like, okay, there's like a software workflow, you know, um, and like actually each part of the software workflow has led to tools that have like done real well, you know, like, like literally like, you know, like IPO um, and like sort of each stage of the, um, you know, pipeline, like these are like multiple dollar purposes. And I do remember in 2009 when I started um, Crowdflower, DevTools, I mean, not only was like ML, like a terrible word that you didn't want to use in the pitch, but like DevTools even was like, people were like, oh, that's stupid. Like, developers have no budget. Um, like, why would you want to make that? And, you know, it's like, look at these, like, oh my god. Um, <clears throat> so, I was thinking that, and then I was like thinking like, okay, like image recognition is like working. And also, I love this, I mean, you've probably seen versions of this, so this is like, like error rate of like the best image algorithm. And it's so funny the way these are like so smooth, right, because I feel like there's a sense I feel like everyone has a sense that like, okay, like this thing comes along like deep learning and then like suddenly like things go from like not working to working. But then when you like step back and look at the performance graphs, actually you just see like steady improvement and then like suddenly things are like good enough that like you actually want to like use it. Like it kind of passes some thre threshold. And like I, this is a, such an awesome, like this is such an awesome graph from The Economist where they're showing like um, audio error rates, you know, over like two decades. And it's like, you know, they have different data sets and things like that. But I really think the big takeaway is like, you know what, like we've actually had pretty steady improvement in this task for the last like 20 years and it's just like you know when the error rate is like 20 percent it's like enraging and when it's like five percent we're kind of like willing to sacrifice all of our privacy 
<laughs> to put like a, to put like a microphone in our house so we can like play music like slightly faster. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, um, so then I think it's like okay, it's like very clear. It's very clear that ML is working. I could talk about all the different domains that's working, but you probably really like feel that, right? Like, I mean, I think like unlike um, you know crypto, where I think we kind of stretch to like find use cases. I think ML, you could talk about hundreds of use cases that you like touch all the time. But like, I think you could ask like, do you really need new tools? And this is like really the pushback um, that I got. And this is actually from both investors and practitioners. They're like, do we really need um, different stuff here? You know, like doesn't the computer stuff work well? I think it's like actually the, the confusion is like when you look at people, I was thinking about this, like you watch like an ML like researcher, an ML engineer, and they look like they're doing the same thing as like a programmer because they're like sitting in front of like a terminal <laughs> and they're doing some like nerd thing, you know? And if, you're like, if you're like an investor, you're just like, okay, it's like it must be the same, you know? Um, and I think I was thinking like, okay, like what is actually the difference, you know? Because um, I feel like I've done both in my life. And I think like, I think like fundamentally it's like you're actually like, you're kind of doing this different thing where, you know, with like normal code that you write, you like, um, you kind of write it for another human and you like version it in a sane way and you kind of know what you're doing. Like you, you kind of have a plan. And like with ML you do a lot more exploration, right? It's like you're kind of like, look, you spend a lot of time um, building essentially like machine generated code that you don't end up using, right? And the stuff doesn't, um, it doesn't diff. I mean, it's like basic stuff, but it really does actually, like the ML models, they get bigger and bigger. They don't diff. Like you could train the same model in two different days. It does exactly the same thing, exactly the same performance, right? And the diff will be the entire file, right? And also that file will be like five gigabytes. Um, and so it's, um, there really are just some like practical um, differences. And I actually think that um, the workflow is different. And I think like, I guess I got this from like figure eight. It's like I feel like you know, there's like there's different takes on this, but essentially it's like you start with training data and you end up with like deployment and monitoring, and then you do some stuff in between. That depending on what kind of company you're running, you probably call these probably slice this in like different places, right? Um, but it sort of felt to me like wow, like actually, you know, I mean, I felt like I made a company that did training data pretty well, and there are others, and then I felt like actually all these steps, like people are kind of kludging um, things together. Um, and then, and then like Google and Amazon want to sell you like a thing that does like all these things. But I was kind of like, you know, I kind of want to, kind of want to like pick one point in the process to start with, so we could like do it, do it really well. Um, and so I, I went around and I asked um, ML researchers, just like, what are your um, problems? I thought it'd be kind of fun to share them, like see if you agree. <laughs> um, so I sort of did that sort of basic customer discovery that probably all of you doing startups like do, where you're just like, tell me about your life, tell me. <laughs> Tell me what could be better. Um, <clears throat> and I think like one like huge one that everyone was saying was like basically the timelines are really hard to predict, right? It's kind of interesting. I, I don't think I would have put my finger on it, but I actually had experienced this. I'll just say like this was my experience of it. Um, I was actually running a Kaggle competition, um, and I remember this one really vividly because this was actually Crowdflower ran it, and it was um, it was it was basically just doing uh, a search thing, but it was like. It was kind of crazy, like in the first couple of days, the accuracy like doubled, you know, and I thought, oh man, like people are gonna like crush this, you know, like we're gonna get to like, you know, like 95% accuracy maybe, and actually it completely flattened out, right? And, and actually it, it flattened out while at the same time the participation was going nuts. And I really felt this because people were like emailing me like crazy to like get more information about exactly how the data set was collected so that they could like, you know, like model it like perfectly, like the, the it was like a like a palpable like fervor to like you know, to, but it, like it's so funny because I was thinking like okay, imagine you're like managing a project that's like doing this, you know what I mean? You're just like man, like you know, like you could be like okay, it's sixty three percent accuracy, great, like we got to like sixty four percent accuracy with like you know a hundred times the like the effort, like it, it's um it's uh. It's still like unsatisfying, right? If you picture, and I, I could imagine like getting frustrated with like, you know, I, and I've been part of like ML projects where it's like, you know, they have like a lot of momentum at first and then they like stall out. And um, I think it's just sort of a knowable. Like I, I sort of feel like, unlike software where people are kind of off by, you know, like a factor of two usually on the, the deadlines they predict if they're experienced. Um, it seems like with, with machine learning, you just really don't know. 
And you can't even use the like past um, performance to, to predict the, the future performance. I think the best example of this is actually the Netflix prize, if you guys remember this, when Netflix offered like a million dollars um, to get an improvement. And you see like just this sort of like, you know, kind of plateauing and that like kind of like sort of steady, very slow, steady improvement that you get from, you know, that we see in like every domain. So that was one. Um, I actually don't know how to fix that, but I think if you could fix that, there's like a really good startup. <laughs> and that I think is a palpable, um, <laughs> palpable issue for people. Um, I think another one is uh, like, I don't know how to put this exactly, <laughs> um, but we actually, it was really interesting. Like, we ran um, in our at, at Weights and Biases, we're like, okay, everybody's going to instrument a model, right, um, on a day, we, like a Thursday, last week, Thursday. Everyone's going to instrument a model. We're just going to, we're all going to use our software, and we're all going to like, you know, feel the experience of our customers by instrumenting a model. And it's really interesting to go into like someone else's model. Like, everyone got stuck. Like, and and this is like engineers that like, you know, these are like good engineers, but it's but like you you take someone else's repository and you just try to like run their code. Like, if you're if you're not used to machine learning, you would expect a random person's GitHub repository to like run. But if you do, if you if you no, but if you do machine learning, you like don't expect it to run, <laughs> you know. And it's like actually like a really <laughs> different. Uh, I mean, it's like it's it's interesting to watch like um, non ML engineers go through that experience. And they're just like, what the hell? Is, like, is this? You know. Um, and and so and I think that's actually um, that's another problem that I don't know how to solve. But it, you know, <laughs> there's a good a good company there. But I think it actually leads to um, it leads to like a lot of issues, right? Like I think like you know, we talk about this reproducibility crisis, there's like a bunch of different reasons for this, right? I mean, I'm sure you all feel this, right? Where like, if you've ever tried to like reproduce the result of a paper, or even like reproduce your own result from like, you know, a few months ago, <laughs> um, it's actually like really, really hard to do. And, um, and I think it's particularly, I think we're going to feel this in a new way, right? Because I'm sure a lot of you have seen this open AI graph of like sort of the, um, the different models and like how much, um, how much compute they take, right? So like compute is taking longer and longer, which means that um, it's getting more expensive even to reproduce people's stuff. Like even even if you could do it, right? So I think like actually like you know I think like these papers like I, I don't have the money to to reproduce um, you know to, I, I can't make that Dota model you know um, so I, I'm really just like taking their their word for it, right? Um, so. Um, you know, another one that um, really bothers people um, is is the uh, you know opacity. And this one, it's like I feel like there's a lot of companies that um, purport to solve it. And there's a lot of papers that like purport to like improve this. But I was trying to explain to my friend who's like a statistician and not in deep learning that the fact that there's all these papers about explainability in deep learning does not mean that there is explainability in deep learning. It means there's not explainability in deep learning. Like, people are like, trying to solve a problem that actually kind of gets worse with like, every iteration um, of the algorithms. And so like, you know, you'll, see, like, um, you know, you'll see these things where like, oh my god, it's like, it does like, you know, it's classifying, um, it's classifying these things like, better than I could. Like, it, this dog is like some kind of dog. And then you know, it messes up bees, you know? <laughs> bees. <laughs> <laughs> it's like why? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, then, <laughs> and, then, and then it's kind of funny, but it's like um, you know, I think like you know, then like you know, Tesla crashes, right? And it's like you know, I think like you can like back into stories around these things, right? But like you know, this one, like I think each Tesla crash actually, there's kind of a good story about somebody doing something weird that probably wasn't in their training data. Like this one was like the the, the semi truck was like perpendicular across the high was the first one. Um, and you know, it's like, I, I think you collect training data for, I mean, I don't know how many miles of training data you need before you have a semi that's perpendicular across the road, right? It's like, that's a rare case because that's really insane for a truck to <laughs> like block the whole road, but you know, they didn't have it and it, it didn't generalize to that. And it seems like clearly they didn't want it to crash. They didn't have a good system in place to do it. Um, and another place you feel it is with um, AlphaGo, right? Like. Um, Anybody else play Go? Yeah? Sweet. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Go. I, this is like, I, AlphaGo was like my favorite paper of all time, I think. Um, I really thought um, computers would not beat humans at Go in my lifetime. Um, so it's funny, you know, actually, I think like ML has been disappointing 
in every domain except games, where it's like always like better than you think. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, the, it it uh, it was really interesting to watch in in the fourth game. It like really made a mistake. Like I remember as a kid, really like kind of important moment in my life was like watching Deep Blue beat Kasparov. Like I remember that was really amazing, and that just felt like this kind of machine that just like crushed him steadily. You know, it's like no mistakes. Just like it's like flawless playing, maybe bad at strategy. And this was like a totally different algorithm. Right? This is like a you know reinforcement algorithm, really like a vision algorithm. Um, and uh, and so it actually kind of failed in a um, in a strange way. It was really different. Um, and I think that's you know that's the kind of ML that we're likely to interact with right for the next twenty years. And, and I don't know if you guys have seen this, but I think it's like everyone should know about it, right? It's like you know when you start to use stats for like you know recidivism, right? You really start to um, you know need to look at what the algorithms are doing. Right? This is like you know black defendants risk scores and white defendants risk scores by some algorithm that they're like actually using to um, you know as, as as evidence in court. Um, and then you see these like explainability. Have you guys seen this as explainability like systems where they like you know, it's like, it's so funny, right? Like, trying to say, like, okay, which, we'll blank out different parts of the image and see, like, which part makes it think it's a guitar and which part makes it think it's a dog. And I feel like this is, like, it's a funny kind of explainability because it's, like, you are, like, explaining what the neural net's doing by just, like, watching it. Like, you're not, like, looking inside it. You're just literally, like, observing it in, like, different modified situations. Um, so I think that the prevalence of these kinds of approaches really shows you that, I think, if anything, explainability is kind of getting worse and worse, despite the fact a lot of people care about it and are working on it. Um, I also don't know how to fix this problem. But this is another, <laughs> so many startup problems that you could do. Um, and then, I think, like, you know, deep learning can be vulnerable to hacking. Um, probably a lot of you have seen this, right? But, like, um, you know, you can run simulations. You can use the same um, gradient descent to find, like, this panda that looks just like, or, like this panda, but the algorithm thinks is, like, a given, right? And I think, like, Again, these things like I think are actually going to start to. When I first saw this, I thought, "Ah, oh, so what? This is like a toy thing, you know? Like that they can make a network, you know? Like they can find an image that's going to trick a network. Of course, in the infinite space of like pixels, there's going to be something. But um, I don't know. I imagine like if you could put my brain in a jar and figure out how to trick me, you'd probably find a lot of good ways to trick me. So <laughs> I do think um, I do think like companies do do care about this, and it doesn't seem like this is really like solved in a, in a satisfying way. Um, and so I think what, what, what we have seen in the last year or two, and this is totally different, like when I was first, um, when I was first pitching my company, um, or first pitching VCs on sort of dev tools for deep learning, lot of, there's a lot of resistance. People thought it was a bad idea. And it's like amazing that it's like really flipped in the last like year and a half. Um, and so you know, what that means when like VCs start like pouring money into something, you start to see like lots of tools, right? So there are like lots and lots of tools. Like this is like red points. Um, <laughs> diagram of like all the tool. And I think they're they like have a little bit of like a stretch, but um, there are actually like lots of tools here. And I will say, if you're kind of interested in a smart VC's perspective on deep learning, I do think the woman at Redpoint that that did this has a lot of good articles on sort of deep learning. I think you'll find, you know, I think it's interesting to see how how investors think about this, and you'll find some good tools um, that, that that she points out, um, including. With some biases. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have sort of like a simpler thing for myself. This is like incredibly self-serving, but I think like this is how I looked at it. I was like, okay, we're gonna do this evaluation step. It's like right in the middle. Um, we kind of know how to do it. We feel like we can like you know make a thing that um, that solves it. And I, but I think like there's a lot of interesting space that I think is kind of under um, underexplored in sort of like the the data preparation. Um, Stages. It's always mystified me why there's not like a really good data preparation company. It's like one of these things that everybody does. It's like so painful. Um, I couldn't tell you of, like a like a top of mind a good a good tool there. Um, there are some stuff in like deployment and monitoring because it more obviously monetizes. I think like um, Algorithmia. I don't know. Do people what do people use? I see people using um, using uh, Cloud ML for this deployment sometimes. But honestly, the most common thing I see for for this stuff is like. Um, you know, their own like kind of home, you know, like call it model not predict in a for loop. It's like pretty. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's sort of this other layer that's kind of interesting. I'm actually, it's funny, when I started, I was really, I thought infrastructure is the biggest problem in ML, um, but I thought Amazon and Google would just like nail it and they would solve it by now. It doesn't seem like they really have. I mean, it's interesting, like um, Floyd Hub 
you know, survives is like, a, you know, I think actually has kind of a nicer interface than, um, than, than SageMaker. I think it's a pretty good, you guys use SageMaker, any of you? You like it, no? I actually, it's funny, I will say, SageMaker is like, started off as this very unambitious project to just sort of make it easy to like, train models simply. And I actually think this is a really good, it was a really good product. And then I think like all these other projects like rebranded themselves as like SageMaker. Like you can sort of see the politics of like a big organization like in this. And so now I couldn't, I don't even, couldn't even really tell you like what this is. But there is like a core product in here that we see a lot of people using. It's probably the number one um, other product we see people use. Um, and then, um, I don't know. I put in Google to be nice, but their products are. Not great. Um, <laughs> so, no, they actually, the, the frameworks are good. So then I think you see this like framework level. We're actually think these companies do a fantastic job. I think it's amazing how good these frameworks are. But I think the closer you sort of get to like a product, um, I think the harder time um, big companies have. I mean, I don't know, do any of you guys work at, at these companies? Maybe, I don't know, need to be like dissing anyone. Um, but I, I Simultaneously, it's really interesting to me how simultaneously talented like Amazon and Google are making like frameworks like very like low level infrastructure, and how much they struggle at stuff that involves any kind of interface. Um, so I, I actually think it's pretty safe to to like kind of make companies in this way. Like I actually it's funny figure eight. Every year I would get a call from Google Cloud and from Amazon. It would just be like a courtesy call from like a PM. Look, we're like launching a competitor, and like the first couple of years I'd be like, oh shit, you know. Like, I'm, I'm like, I was like afraid. And then like, they just never like actually launched it, you know? And then like, I think they launched it. I think, I think they did. But I, I actually, like I haven't heard of people like using it, so I don't know. I don't know, it's, it's funny, it's a funny, it's weird. I mean, the companies do get crushed, but I think if you stay more on the, infra on the interface side of things, I think for some reason, dev interfaces are particularly hard uh, for these big companies. Like, you know, you'd think like GitHub would have come out of Google or Microsoft or something, but you know that was like its own its own company. So um, anyway, and um, and so I want to show you the the tool that I made. I've been like working on it for the last year and a half. I mean, I just did a couple simple slides, but basically, um, really light instrumentation. And by the way, I'll do this instrumentation for you if you want. I really would love to do it for you. It would, it would like warm my heart. So just literally email me, and you can have this instrumentation for free. I'll I'll come to you since you're here. Um, and then what you get is uh, is you get this. So you get this like list. So this is this is um, this is one of our users. And and um, man, I should have I should have done I should have done your Yaroslav. I should have. If I'd known you're gonna be here, I would have I would have taken some of your data. But anyway. You can look, maybe Yaroslav will show you his account if you ask him nicely. Um, <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> you know, you can, like, you can, like, tag all your stuff, right? And so then you say, like, okay, I want to see, like, all my best runs that involve, like, you know, some two-layer thing and no bounding box, right? And you can just, like, find it. And you can, like, um, you know, build these graphs that, that go across the runs. And so you basically have all your data saved, and you can, and you can like, um, Save all your data, see all your data, um, and share it with people. And it's a, um, I think it's a pretty, <clears throat> pretty simple product. It's hard because we have to make it work in like every environment that people use. And like, it's one really interesting thing. Someone was just telling me this, but like, so many of our users simultaneously use like TensorFlow and PyTorch at the same time for even the same application. Who's telling me? You were telling me you do that. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it doesn't. Why, why do you do that? I'm curious. No, no, I, have, <laughs> I have two networks. One is this. Uh, one is one yeah, right, right. I'm, ju I'm just generating a demo. I see. Like the uh, open source code is like the best implementation. Just run right, whatever one works. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, it's so works. fascinating to me the way you really would, I really would have thought that there'd be one dominant framework. And for some reason, it's just like, and everybody have a theory? Do you have a theory on that? Uh, people seem to like PyTorch more. So. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway. Feels like uh, there's uh, research universities are like pushing PyTorch and then just use TensorFlow. So there's a constant inflow of new PyTorch users. <laughs> <laughs> I see. 
<laughs> until they get crushed by their <laughs> corporate overlord. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. They're both so willing to break compatibility. <laughs> like, it's spectacular. And we try to support like all the recent versions, so we, that's like, we feel it. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, anyway, that's my presentation. And, if, and look at this. You could, you could get this beautiful chart <laughs> of all your data, and I'll even do it for you. <laughs> Yes, I have a question. Yes, I have a question about that. Um okay, so I'm not like an um, ML or AI practitioner, so sure. um maybe this the answer is obvious. Uh but like on that last point about um stuff like all these examples constantly being broken because of these libraries breaking compatibility i mean there's like solutions to this in the software world right which is like locking your dependency version so um like why is that not like a standard practice and like what are other reasons why like it's machine learning results aren't easily reproducible well i have some theories on it but i, I would invite other people to answer i think like one thing is that um because like these Model. I actually don't think this was as bad <clears throat> before deep learning. Well, it was kind of bad before deep learning for one reason, which is that grad school trains you to be a horrendous engineer. Because it basically, it's like your goal is to write a paper, so it's like write code as fast as you can, it's going to get thrown away, and then you like stop. Right? So that's like, it's just like you never deal with the bugs, you never deal with users. You basically just learn to like, I mean, like, I don't know, like when I, I remember like my first job, my, my co-founder actually was just like, oh my God, like I just like, <laughs> like I cannot believe how bad your code is. Um, so I think, I, but I think that's actually slightly getting better. But I think the real thing is that, um, is that I think when, when you switch from a CPU to a GPU, when you change this, like you're basically like breaking the lowest abstraction. And so then like all the stuff on top of it breaks. So like you have all these versions that like need to line up. And I think like, it probably drives like TensorFlow crazy trying to like match Kudanen versions. And a lot of them like don't match, right? And then like the Kudanen versions need to match the like CUDA version, which needs to match the GPU version. So I think like I think like software, I think, kind of works because like we've built up a lot of abstractions and like a lot of like, you know, like stable abstractions. And I think like um, I think the biggest thing, the biggest issue I see people running into is it's really hard for them to like match exactly the same. Um, hardware configuration and the hardware configurations are changing, right? Because, like, you know, like you might be running on a slightly different, um, you might be running on a slightly different piece of hardware than another person did, but that means that actually you kind of need different um, versions of the libraries. And I think there's like a lot of enthusiasm, <clears throat> and people don't exactly know the de design constraints that they want for these libraries, right? So, um, you know, we've watched like PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, probably like a, there's probably like a rush to ship them. And then there's like, you know, as they kind of realize like, oh, we, we did this wrong, they just break the, 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 I mean, they seem to have a culture of just like making lots of like breaking changes each version. I don't know, does anybody have any smarter thing to say about that? That's my theory. Uh, I mean, I think there's uh, just a general expectation that your code will not work. <laughs> <laughs> so if you know it won't work, you don't have an integration test. You're not going to do all of the other nice things. And the reason we have this is because these frameworks are new. Right. Before TensorFlow, it was very hard to do routing with GPU. Like, I, uh, I was using MATLAB as a GPU plugin. Right. It was you know, half working. Um, and we actually saw this uh, situation earlier. For instance, uh, Windows 3.11, there was a thing called the uh, DLL help. So basically, you install a new application. There is like various permutation of libraries. Uh, so it was new, and then they figured out how to fix it uh, 10 years later. So I think like in 10 years, we'll make it <laughs> Yeah, and there's been like a lot of improvements in virtualization for software, like Docker. And um, yeah, 
it sounds like so right. the ML. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. I, I think that's yeah. limitation because what happens? You can freeze the things and it'll work a year later, but it will not uh, be able to use the latest uh, like research advances. And what happens? You have to upgrade the the framework, and then every you have to upgrade everything. So your virtualization doesn't work anymore. I mean, another thing I've. <laughs> uh, another thing is like I've I've also used Docker images and r r like I was running the containers. One of the problems with that is like let's say you want your model in in actual to run in real time. Like when you run a Docker image, there is overhead, right? So you don't want a Docker image. You don't want virtualization, but like virtualization makes it things run. So like you you're stuck in between using you know like having a pimp install and then you're like your CUDA library is not exactly right and if you use docker you're like you don't have the same performance so yeah so there is something like a team of uh, five people whose job is to do the tensorflow amis plus uh -huh. the team, but the big part is the ami so they figure out the magic uh, combination of versions which work well together uh, so yeah so the lesson is you have to use Products of teams like that. Yeah. Can I tell you? Well, I don't know. This is like, uh, these guys don't pay me, but if you guys use Lambda OS, that just like, so Lambda Labs will sell you a machine. Yeah. Um, but they also have like just the, I, I don't know, I, I like, I feel like every time I get a new GPU, I just like, I like set aside a day to just like fight with the computer. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I like, I installed like the Lambda OS out of just like desperation. And it just like, man, it just like worked. I couldn't believe it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm wondering, you made a point about sort of uh, machine learning being a DevOps nightmare, part of which we just talked about. Yeah. I, I'm interested in sort of uh, failure, like what happens, so, you know, before machine learning or whatever, like you'll get a 503, right? Like your database will crash, something won't work. Now you have this thing that you don't necessarily have observability on. Yeah. Like how do you know that when you call predict, yeah. the result is right. Like, what's yeah. state of the art? Where, where's, what's the literature? I think there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in this. Um, I think the, uh, I think the literature gets it a little wrong because I think academics, people, are, they don't have the experience of deployment. And actually, the things that go wrong are kind of simple. Um, I remember, um, I worked at, at um, Yahoo Search, and back then it actually had some of the market share. So like we, we did, we did care. Um, and I remember there was like a language that nobody happened to speak, and like one day like people literally deployed like the inverse ranker. I forget how that happened, but you can imagine it happens, right? I mean, it's just like you know, like somebody's like the training. There's a whole bunch of like feature pipeline steps where like the data is getting you know changed and like. It doesn't line up, you know, and, and like, and it was actually hard to tell. I mean, they only could tell by the fact that the ad revenue skyrocketed in that country <laughs> because the search results were so bad that the ads were like seemed very relevant in comparison. <laughs> um, but um, but we see, yeah, I mean, we see it. There's a, I think like, I think like examining. I, I bet you there will be some really interesting companies around um, like monitoring, like. Um, your pipelines and and because because the, the the subtle error right is that your model gets out of sync with your um, feature pipeline which often your feature pipeline includes other models that are doing stuff so the versioning is hard right and and um, I've seen it a lot of companies and a lot of like stories over beers with ML practitioners that that's like often out of sync and like and it you know it doesn't throw an error right it just delivers to greater performance so um, you know you can look at like and people, there are papers on like sort of like feature drift and like, you know, um, output drift. I think like, I think if you, I think that you would be surprised how um, little monitoring there is of that at, um, at companies that really should care. I think a lot of times it's like what they do notice is like if user behavior changes in the least, right, they really notice that and then they like change something. Um, but I, I, I bet you, if I was going to, I was going to start another company. That would be in the top three, I think. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Mike? Um, you mentioned that um, what's more important is the 
quantity of data that uh, we train and um, not so much the model as uh -huh. much as the quantity of uh, data that is used. Uh -huh. um, I recently uh, tried using uh, voice transcription services from Google, Amazon, and Rev. And Rev? Okay. All right. Uh -huh. um, I found Google to be the most erroneous, uh -huh. Amazon in the middle, uh -huh. Rev to be the most accurate. Uh -huh. But my assumption would be that in terms of training data, Google probably had the most training data followed very, or Amazon and Google probably equal amounts of very large training data sizes compared uh -huh. to Rev. Yet the accuracy was significantly higher in Rev's outputs. Uh -huh. What do you think would account for that? Well, I think like when, so Rev is a company that does transcription, right? And they, they've done it for a long time with humans. So I'm assuming you use the automated system, not the human. Yeah. So. Um, I think one of, the, one of the keys with training data is that it has to really match, exactly match the, the scenario that your model is um, running on. Which kind of goes back to your question of like, this is a way that you can get kind of small errors that you don't see. Like actually when I first built that Raspberry Pi robot, I was noticing that its accuracy is really bad even though it was trained on ImageNet. And I was asking my friend who's a roboticist, like why is my accuracy so much worse than um, on the robot than like you know, you're like claiming in the in the papers and and he's like actually it's a known thing and it's because like the ImageNet data set it's like pictures online where people tend to like frame the pictures to like look right at the object that they care about but a robot isn't necessarily going to like look right at the the thing and so it's like a subtle it's a subtle very subtle change so the training data is like humans taking pictures of stuff. And the deployment is like robot looking at stuff, but it, you can imagine it's like there's differences there that, that humans generalize beautifully well, but um, the ML algorithms still don't. And I mean, this is just speculation, but um, you know, for example, the way people talk into something that they think is a computer versus the way, I mean, I just know this because I used to work in NLP. The way people talk to each other is much harder to process than a human talking like, to a computer that it thinks might not understand it. Right, and so I, I think that Rev actually has maybe less training data, but I bet you it's like exactly, because it's like literally humans transcribing things that people wanted transcribed, whereas Google and Amazon are probably using some data exhaust of, of something else to get that training data. So that's just a guess, but um, I think often it's one way that data moats aren't as powerful as people think they are. Because if you, can, if you can collect that perfect data set that's exactly like the thing that you're um, running on, it can, it can really get you an advantage. And you know, companies, I think, often become valuable if their data set is like really the, the, the perfect thing for the application that, that somebody cares about. I remember when Rev was just starting, I'm happy to hear that their, uh, <laughs> their service is good. You should write a little blog post. They would, I, mean, I know they would, they would love you forever if you did that. <laughs> Do you guys have competitors? <laughs> we, we, we have some competitors, but they're terrible. I wouldn't even want to. <laughs> I wouldn't want to tell you about them because they would just, you know, they'd probably like steal your data and format your hard drive. <laughs> Yeah, no, the, I mean, the, the evaluation space is done. It's, we, you know, <laughs> we've cornered the market. So. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, I don't know. There's, there's a company, uh, Comet ML, that's um, very similar. And then there's like, I mean, Neptune that's been, uh, that's a little more like kind of focused on collaboration. They used to do like a more platform. Thing. Yeah, yeah. We see, well, actually, it's funny, like, um, a lot of companies, I think the space is really confusing right now because a lot of companies are trying to rebrand themselves as ML. I think a lot of ML platforms that did a lot of things, they're kind of picking the thing that's working and like narrowing on that, but they don't totally change their website to tell you that. 
And then a lot of companies that were doing something sort of tangential to ML, like for example, like you know, SigOpt did um, like optimization. I think mostly for like um, like hedge funds and sort of like numerical processing scenarios. And I think they realized like, deep learning is a great use case for them. So now they do like a lot of ML stuff. Um, but I think it'd be it'd be hard to figure out what they do if you looked at their website. So I think in 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 like settled markets where everyone sort of agrees what the categories are, it's really easy to figure out what companies do. <laughs> but in like nascent markets like this where like a lot of companies' um, assets come from like investors. So I think a lot of times a website is actually like collateral for an investor, like not for you as a, as a customer. It can be like pretty confusing. I, I mean, I personally find it. Like people are always like, oh man, like saw this like ML company, like what do they do, you know? And I'll even like pull up the website and I'm like, man, I, I'm like pretty close to their target audience and like I can't figure out what they do, so. I hope our website isn't like that. Tell me if. <laughs> Tell me if you get confused. We try to be clear. <laughs> Take a look and give me feedback. Yeah, question. <laughs> so I had a question about uh, yeah. your previous example about how AlphaGo and you know uh -huh. basically different iterations of it, Alpha Zero and others, yeah, yeah. are basically improving the games world. Uh -huh. uh, do you see uh, that translating into real world uh, ML applications? Uh, the reason I'm asking this is, so particularly if you look at AlphaGo or like the game of Go, yeah. it has a fairly uh, limited state space, like there's a board game, uh -huh. but it has a fairly long action space. Uh -huh. uh, unlike let's say self-driving cars, where yep. your action space is very limited, you just steer or brake or throttle, yeah. versus your state space is like really uh, chaotic and big. Uh -huh. So, and increasingly that's becoming a challenge, like uh, ML researchers are primarily working on virtual worlds, uh, uh -huh. let's say Alpha Star, which is the more recent uh, yeah. DeepMind uh, game. So I don't know how to solve that. Uh, like, is there a good direction that you see happening in ML research for that? Well, I think like, um, I mean, OK, so like obviously like AlphaGo hasn't like immediately translated into people using reinforcement learning all over the place successfully, right? So I mean, I think like, I think AlphaGo is a really like impressive achievement that we shouldn't discount. But you know the the techniques they used like you know didn't it 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 doesn't like obviously apply um, to the the real world like like lots of advances right mm -hmm. in in um, in technology. I do think like um, there is a trend that I find like really intriguing, which is um, when um, when people can build realistic simulators. Um, you know you start to be able to use these like same techniques, right? Because then you can sort of um, generate like infinite amounts of data and you know more about the world because you simulated it, right? So you know, if your simulation is realistic enough, um, and, I, and I think like, um, I mean, I think like it's, it's funny to watch. I mean, I think the robotics is really interesting example where um, like the things that roboticists find impressive are like so unbelievably like, unimpressive. You know what I mean? Like, like I realize they're like impressive to me, but it's like, oh man, like you could like, you know, you could pick up this podium like one out of three times without like knocking it over. Like, you know, like like a two year old could do that, right? Um, so, but I think, but still, I think actually, it seems like the most promising direction, or one of the really promising directions in that is like, you know, simulating the world. And even simulation isn't perfect. People have found that you can take these simulated worlds and then like unleash a robot in the real world trained on that and, and it has good properties. So I think like if if the simulation technology gets good enough and if that turns out to be a good direction, I think we'll we maybe we'll say that the start of it was was the alpha go success. It's also I don't know if you guys have, have you guys been watching Alpha Chess? This is actually I think this is a fun fact. So like um, you know chess playing after Deep Blue got incredibly conservative and like basically because Deep Blue really was good at counting the pieces, like would never sacrifice material, didn't care about the position. Um, chess players started to do that. So like over the last 20 years, chess players have become very, very like non-strategic, like just very tactical. And it turns out that was actually the wrong direction. So they took, the, so um, it was just an artifact of like a very deep um, uh, search algorithm, right? So now actually the, the alpha chess algorithm plays this like, really like wild kind of swashbuckling style of chess that would have been like, you know, humans would have done like the 60s and 70s, right? It's like, it plays like a maniac, like sacrificing like pieces and, and winning. And actually like, it's crazy, like immediately like humans 
have like flipped to like <laughs> to follow that. So now we're like just clearly chasing the um, the algorithms in in games. So I don't know. There's some great. Um, I'm not like an expert chess player, but the YouTube videos of like like expert chess comment commenting on um, Alpha Chess is pretty fun. And even I think Alpha Go. I mean I don't know. I was I played a lot of Go, and it's been really interesting to watch. Um, Professional Go players like really switch their strategies based on what um, what what AlphaGo does. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's definitely not like saving the world, but it's it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so another question was re related to how you uh, explained how interpretability is a challenge still in yeah. the ML world. Uh -huh. Do you think it's the right problem to solve? Because if you think about invention as a process uh, yeah. we always had steam engines before we could explain thermodynamics we had uh, you know the uh, crude batteries before we had a good model for electricity uh -huh. so do you think we should really obsess over interpretability or like why neural networks are less explainable or doesn't make any sense you know i think this is almost like an aesthetic i mean my, my brother-in-law is like a statistician mm -hmm. and it like drives him insane that like people don't care that much about explainability, and like, I don't know. I don't care that much. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's like it's. I, I would be sort of interested if someone. I mean, I don't know. Like the hand wavy things that people tell me about why neural networks maybe work, I find kind of intriguing. But it's not like my life's work. Like I, I think I really am impressed by the things that they can do. I mean, that's like for me. That's what's like fun about it. So I'm happy that like different people have different interests. I think, I don't know. I I would hate to. I, would, I think it would be really frustrating to work on explainability, but I'm glad somebody's trying. <laughs> sure, yeah, totally. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, actually, like, or, or I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the US, like, you can't, like, you know, the credit score, you have to, like, that has to be, like, you can't just be like, my crazy algorithm. That's like definitely not like biased. Said you don't get credit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah try, like, trust me. Yeah, I asked it. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody was telling me in the software beta launch they have to use linear regression and they are told which factors they can put in there. But you know what's kind of interesting? They can do whatever they want with their marketing material. It's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I'm like talking in front of a video camera on a touchy subject I don't totally know about. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So you mentioned all this, you know, like steps of the like, machine learning, you know, like pipeline from training, collecting training data up to, you know, like monitoring the uh -huh. system in production. And you have yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. It more specifically what you mean by data processing. Like how is it different from gathering the training data and how is it different from actually training? Sure. I mean, I think there's almost always a step between the training data that you have and like what you feed into your algorithm. Right? Like um, you know, like you're almost always like processing things and like weighting things and that kind of builds up over time right so like you know like the very first time you like classify some image maybe you don't have that right but then like you know if you're doing like a real world deployment of like a recommendation system you have a bunch of like weird inputs of like things you might know about the person and like you probably need to get that into like a format that like makes sense um, and in fact I think like if you talk to like ML engineers at like a, a bigger company I think they would say that's like what they spend like possibly you know most of their time doing um, so I don't know I mean I think it's like a real it's I've always been intrigued maybe in 10 years I'll do I'll do that company but I, I feel like it always seems like there's an opportunity for the amount of like complaining that you hear like ML engineers do about that like data kind of munging step like how few interesting tools there are I don't know yeah 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 totally totally yeah. Do you see more, um, thank you, more traditional ETL products taking that, sp um, like filling that gap? Um, so like it, Amazon Glue and I know Google has a 
offering too. I just don't remember. No, the name. totally. I, I think I think traditional ETL products don't quite fit that. I think their goal. I think that that like. I think actually like well I don't know I mean I may be wrong I mean uh, but I'm not like an expert on this space but I think like when I look at like more traditional ETL products um, I think they're kind of designed and like imagining a world where it's like we have to like transform this data in a way that's like very auditable and like it's always going to happen the same way because like you know we have like you know some like important like financial report that's like coming from you know this this data. And so they, they're very, like, um, careful and rigid. And I think that's actually why, even though these are often good, powerful tools, I think a lot of people in ML end up building their own ad hoc ETL stuff because those tools are too verbose and rigid for them. And what they want, like, what they really want is to, like, be able to experiment for a long time and then get their experiments into kind of, like, a reliable form. And, like... I mean, just an example. I mean, do you guys realize, like, I mean, Netflix is, like, public about this, right? Like, their, like, ETL system is, like, Jupyter Notebooks. I mean, that's, like, that, that sort of shows that it's, like, a different, <laughs> at least for Netflix, it's a different set of design criteria than, um, you know, your traditional ETL situation. Um, so I actually did a startup based on this, and our learning <coughs> um, if you start breaking things down that people are doing in that pre-processing step, there's like categories of things that people are doing, like standardizing, normalizing, or for images, they're doing certain things. But within that, there's so much uh, customization that the complexity grows so fast that it's hard for a tool, like Lucas said, like to capture the n exact thing that people want to do. And then it's just easier to write scripts. So if some, unless someone can figure that out, it's really hard. <laughs> but, yeah, let's have a round of applause. Thanks.